Hi everyone and welcome back. Um, we're gonna, you should have already um, read chapter one in your uh, textbook and watched the accompanying uh, chapter one PowerPoint presentation and then you should already, ha already have uh, all of your chapter review guides so now you can take out your chapter two review guide for Allied Health 209 and follow along with this video and fill it in. Uh, your first test is going to be on chapters one and two. Um, my tests come directly from the chapter review guides. So if you um, read your chapters in your textbook, uh, as well as watch these PowerPoints, fill out your review guides, study those um, along with your abbreviations and your key terms, you will make an A in this class. I promise you, that's all you have to do. Um, is do that. So um, this chapter, chapter two, is on regulations, microscope setup, and quality assurance. Now in lab, we will have a microscope test in lab where you will uh, identify the parts of the microscope and you will go through, um, and we'll, we'll do this in lab, you'll go through uh, getting your microscope set up so that a physician or a lab tech can come in and it's all set up and ready to go. They look down in the scope and can look at whatever it is that you've set up for them. So um, I will teach you that in lab and then you will have a test on not just the part, but how to um, get something set up on the scope for a physician or a lab tech. So without further ado, let's get started on this chapter. Um, I always try because I know your time is limited. I know you guys are taking other classes, so I don't want to do a lot of talking when you can obviously read this, but I don't want to just put up PowerPoints either. And just always keep in mind that you can reach out to me by email. You can call me. Um, you can text me. And uh, I do have my office hours and during my office hours, we can always do a video conference uh, if we need to, whatever I need to do to help you be successful in this class, that is what I'm going to do. So never hesitate to reach out to me if you have any questions, comments, or concerns. So one of the first things I want to touch on real quick is your homework activity. Okay, so just remember, you are going to have, um, when you, when you, cause by now you probably, uh, if you're watching this, you've already been to lab class. In, in lab classes, our face-to-face, -face, it's a little bit of a hybrid class, but it's a lot of face-to-face. -face. Uh, you will be uh, issued or given a white laboratory manual with all our lab activities in there and, and things of that nature. You will also purchase, by now you've done that, a one-inch black binder that the first day of lab class, I gave you all of your review guides and study guides for finals and labs and a bunch of other paperwork that had three holes punched in them for you already. And you will place those in that black binder, put tabs in them. And when you take your first test, you will bring that around that same time and we'll work out in lab exactly when that'll be. You'll turn that black binder into me and I will grade it on a couple of things. One, that you have it, that you've placed all your chapter reviews and other information in that black binder that you have it tabbed off and organized because that is the key, especially if you're a medical assistant, a lab assistant, or even a phlebotomist. If you work in healthcare, you want to be organized so you can get to your things quickly and efficiently so that you can uh, get results and be very organized. So um, I will grade you on that and I will grade you over the fact that you have filled out your uh, review guides because again, if you want to be successful in this class, in especially the lecture portion of this class, read your chapters in your textbook, your uh, laboratory and diagnostic testing and ambulatory care. Okay, you read that chapter one, watch the accompanying PowerPoint on Canvas, fill out your review guides, study the review guides, you will do well in, uh, in this lecture class. So for homework, accompanying your white lab binder and your black uh, binder for lecture, so those are the two binders you have, one for lecture, one for lab, and then you will have your textbook. Uh, there's a textbook and then there's a accompanying, it's named the same, it's that laboratory and diagnostic testing and ambulatory care, but it is a workbook versus a textbook. So on page 223 through 227 in that workbook, you will find an exposure incident report. 
okay? And what y'all want you to do is take this scenario that I'm not going to read out to you. Pretend we're acting right. We do that a lot in lab. You pretend because doing this over and over again gets you prepared for your patients when you're out there. You will take this scenario and you will pretend as though it happened and then you will fill out the exposure incident report dealing with this specific incident, okay? If you have, this is gonna be a homework activity that'll be due in lab. And again, make sure you have your syllabus in your black binder as well. And you need to frequently check in with your tentative course calendar because your tentative course calendar is very important to you because it tells you, all you do is you look in the column over to your right and it'll say chapter one test on chapters one and two. You take your finger, move it over to your left, and that'll tell you the date that that test is going to take place. Same thing with turning in homework, same thing with your research paper. All these things are listed on there and they tell you when they're due. And then you'll have uh, updates on Canvas as well. So this is something you wanna get started working on, okay? And again, if you have any questions on this, please get with me, okay? I'll be glad to go over it with you to make sure that you get it done because Marib says these things have to be done 100% correct. So if there's blanks you're not sure if they needed to be filled in or something like that and you can't you know, make the best out of it or you can't figure it out, please reach out to me and I'll be glad to help you. Or we will be talking about this. We will be going over this exposure incident report form in lab, okay? So make sure you study the key terms for each chapter. There's a large section of key terms on all the tests this semester. Uh, questions from this section are the most commonly missed questions on my test, okay? It's because I don't think people really study these key terms and understand that it will be on a test and you need to understand these terms. You have to understand what things mean in healthcare and you have to be able to speak intelligently to your patients, your coworkers, the physicians. And so learning these terms and what they mean is a really big part of this. So make sure you don't miss out on some points by not studying those key terms and abbreviations. Okay, we're gonna do a quick review, okay, of uh, chapter one. And I'm gonna move through this relatively quickly. I'm not going to read each one of these questions off. What you guys should do is use this as a study tool. You can pause this, you can rewind it, and you can go through each one of these questions to make sure that you're able to quickly get the answer because your, your lecture test online will be timed. So you need to know this information, okay? You're not gonna have time to look it up. I know a lot of people think, oh, I'm taking a test online. You're not gonna have time for that. If you don't already know the answer to these questions and can answer them quest quickly, you are not gonna make a good uh, grade on that lecture test, okay? Okay, so now we're going to get into chapter two. Our learning objectives are just the things that when you finish reading this chapter in your textbook, you finish watching these PowerPoint presentations, you fill out your review guides and you start studying them. These are the things that you will now know. You will be able to explain the purpose of CLIA 1988, that law and its benefits to the patient, okay? You'll be able to label the parts of a compound microscope and explain the function of each 
and all the other things that are listed on our learning objectives, which are also in the front of your uh, each chapter in your um, textbook. You will be able to identify quality assurance practices in healthcare, and that is going to be a mayor requirement. You will be able to discuss the 10 areas of good laboratory practice and define accuracy, precision, and reliability when observing the results of your standard controls. Okay, you will be able to analyze healthcare results as reported in graphs and tables per mayor. And you will be able to understand the uses and benefits of electronic medical records and barcoding as they re relate to medical laboratories. So starting off, we're talking about CLIA, okay? When you sit down to take your test, if you can't speak intelligent about CLIA, I have failed somewhere because I am going to, for lack of a better word, beat you over the head with CLIA because CLIA is very, very important especially when you're dealing with any lab that teaches that, uh, excuse me, test for test human specimens. And it is vitally important when you're talking about physician office labs and small labs where laboratory assistants or um, medical assistants are performing CLIA weighed testing, because you wanna make sure that whatever testing you're being trained to do in your physician's office lab or in your laboratory, and you're performing them, that you are following the laws and guidelines set out by CLIA. And you're not going to be able to know if you're doing the right thing if you don't even know what they are. Okay, so let's start off with, um, you want to know what is the law that was passed to protect patients from inaccurate test results, right? And what is that? CLIA, right? Just what we're talking about. Like I said, beat over the head. So CLIA requires that all labs, be, if they're doing human testing, of human specimens that they are certified by the Secretary of Health and Human Services. So the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS, administers the cert certificate, okay? So the labs are certified by the Secretary of Health and Human Services, but CMS is the one who administers this certificate, okay, to you or to your lab, showing that certificate certification and and requires that all medical labs register and pay a fee based on the level of complexity of the test they perform. So of course you can imagine the bigger the hospital, the more complex tests they do, the higher the fee may be. The certificate for POLs, physician's office labs, that perform only waived tests is called a certificate of waiver. So if you're the only one working in your physician's office lab and you're performing tests you want to make sure that you have a certificate of waiver and that you are only performing waived tests. So here's one of those critical thinking higher learning activities. And this activity is a way for you to pause this PowerPoint presentation right now, read this scenario and see if you can answer the question. Because what I'm doing is taking the things that you're learning in class, learning in lab, and then you're able to put it together in your mind and be able to think and critically think through these things as if you were applying them out in real life in your lab, okay? So I'll go, I'll always go over the first one and then going through, you guys will just read it, pause it, and see if you can answer the question. So the lab in Dr. Brown's POL is registered with the federal government. What would the certificate showing certification be called? A certificate of waiver, right? because he has a small lab inside his practice, but we only do waived tests inside that lab, and we have a medical assistant that does them, or a laboratory assistant that does them, and so you need to make sure that you have a certificate of waiver showing that you are able to perform these tests, report them out on patients, and bill for them, because you will not get paid for these tests, and if they find out you don't have your certificate of waiver, it's not up to date, they can come back and ask for that money back many years in the past. So you always want to make sure your lab is up to date. So what government official requires that all labs be certified? The Secretary of Health and Human Services, right? We talked about this. And then we talked about the government agency that administers their certificate which is CMS, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. 
Okay, so clear, high, and moderately complex labs, right? Remember, there are three levels of tests under clear. There's waived, which are usually very easy, and then there's moderately complex and highly complex, okay? And you'll need to know those three. Those will be on a test. So what level of test do hospitals and big reference laboratories usually perform? Those are usually moderately complex and highly complex tests. And then again, what level test do the POLs usually run? We talked about this one, right? Wade. Okay, I hope you guys are pausing those critically thinking slides and going through them slowly to make sure that you're learning this stuff. These are a great tool to, if you're taking classes at home, and right now a lot of us don't have access to friends or classmates to be able to bounce these questions off of to make sure that we get this down for a test, those slides are a really good way to help you do that. Okay, moderately complex and highly complex tests are required by CLIA to be monitored by three different systems, okay? We have QA, QC, and proficiency testing, okay? So let's look at each one of those. So quality assurance, right? That's the overall process that strives to improve the reliability, efficiency, and quality of healthcare in general. That's all healthcare, but it includes the lab. And a lot of times, quality assurance can look at What's going on with that patient from the minute they step foot out of their car in the parking lot of the hospital or lab until they are discharged and sent home, okay? So quality assurance wants to check that entire process from beginning to end to make sure that each one of those processes is working efficiently and effectively to make sure we're taking care of our patient, right? And that includes what's going on in the lab, but then you have quality control, right? Okay, this is where you take a known uh, specimen or control, okay? And it could be a real specimen or it could be a, a, a synthetic type specimen, but it has a known set value. We know when we run this control, let's just say a glucose control. We know when we run this glucose control using our glucose machine, that's a wave test, right? That we're going to get a result that falls between this certain range. So if you're working in a doctor's office where you know you do a lot of glucoses all day, every day, when you come in that morning, you will go ahead and run your controls and you run two levels of control and just say you run a normal and a high. You're going to record those results. You're going to make sure that they come in within range. So that tells you that your machine is working correctly, right? And it helps us to establish, and we'll need to know, we'll learn the differences with these. There's reliability, there's accuracy and precision. And laboratory tests need to have all three of those things. And these known controls are the things that help us to establish that, okay? Then we have what we call proficiency testing programs, right? This is the process in which an unknown specimen, okay, is sent to your lab from an outside agency to prove the reliability, accuracy, and precision of your laboratory test. So you wanna make sure that you're doing your quality control in-house and you're doing it properly, because if you're not, then you're not gonna know if, if your reliability, accuracy, and precision is correct. And then all of a sudden, if you get this unknown specimen from the outside, you're running the risk of failing that and getting in big trouble with CLIA. So remember, QA is an overall process, okay? Dealing with healthcare in general, and the lab is just a part of that. QC is what we use inside our labs to make sure that our laboratory tests are being reliable, accurate, and precise. And then there's also proficiency testing where an outside source sends you in an unknown specimen, you test it, record your results, and send it back to them, and then they let you know if it worked or not, if you, if you fell within their range. So, the provider perform microscopic procedure certificate. That allows healthcare workers to do wave testing and basic microscopic examinations, okay? 
The actual reading and reporting of the microscopic findings must only be done by a physician or some type of laboratory professional, not a certified medical assistant and not a certified lab assistant. So these are little sections that you will see inside the packet that I handed out to you that's in your black, one inch black binder. And these are just some things that you're at home right now, you could stop and try to do this now, but these are ways for you to learn to take what you learn and be able to describe it in your own words. Okay, I am just going to help you out quickly with some things that you want to make sure is included in this concept. Okay, but you need to fill these out and you need to fill them out in your own words describing CLIA. You want to make sure when you're answering this that you include that CLIA was formed to protect patients from inaccurate test results and that there are three main complexity levels of lab tests, your waived, your moderately complex, and your highly complex. Okay, moving on to this microscope procedure, okay? We were talking, we're talking about the identifying the parts and functions of the microscope. So, and we will go over this in lab with each piece. So I'm gonna quickly go over this, but you also need to use this to fill out your review guides. But talking about, and we will in lab, uh, locate uh, the structure. So you have the base, and that's just the part that supports the microscope down at the bottom. Then you have an arm that comes up from that microscope. Okay, and then we'll name and locate the parts of the microscope that holds the slide. Okay, you have the stage, that big flat piece that sits on there, and then on top of the stage is the mechanical slide clamp and the control knobs that can move that stage from one side to the other. Okay, and again, we will go over this in lab in more detail. So you got to name the um, location of the illuminating structures. You have your light source, light source, excuse me, your condenser, which intensifies your light, and the condenser adjuster. You have your diaphragm and levers. Then as far as your magnifying uh, structures, you have your objective lens that's close to the object. You have the nose piece that that's where the, your objective lenses are attached to and you rotate the nose piece so that you can rotate between one to the other objective lens. And then you have your ocular lens or your eye piece, which is closest to your eye. So you can see that objective closest to the object, ocular eye closest to the eye. Here's another critical thinking. So please use these guys, pause and make sure that you can answer this. Okay, continuing talking about the microscope. So you, you're talking about the adjusters now. This is just what you're looking down in there and make it become more clearer to you so you can see the cells better or the bacteria if it's under there, whatever may be under there. You have a coarse objective and a fine objective. Okay, and we'll go over that and the importance of both of those as you are using your microscope. And then when you talk about magnification, okay, so, you know, you want to talk about what is the power of the ocular. So what do you want to what you want to do is multiply the power of the objective by the power of the ocular or M equals O times O. OK, the power of the ocular is always 10. Right. So you want to multiply 10. By the by, by your object, the power of your objective, OK, to get your true what your total magnification is between the objective and the ocular. And remember, the ocular is always 10. So here's one of those slides. So you have the 10 objective times the ocular, which is 10. So 10 times 10, you got 100 um, is your total magnification. Okay, we're still on the microscope talking about the microscope, right? 
So we're talking about changing the refraction light and increasing the upper limit of your magnification. Immersion oil with the 100 times objective. This is the way you do this, right? When we want to see those really, really small things, right? So what should you do when finished using your microscope? So you're done using it. You want to put it up. So you're going to use a lens paper to clean off the oil from your oil objective uh, lens. Never use Kleenex or anything else because they're a little coarse and they could scratch your objective, okay? Always clean all other lenses before cleaning the oil objective because you don't want to take that oil that would be on the lens paper and then put it on the other objectives that oil does not need to go on to. So you clean all your lower objectives all the way up and then clean your oil last, okay? And then you cover your microscope with the dust cover, carry the microscope with two hands, with one being on the base and one being under the bottom, I mean, one being on the arm and one being under the bottom of the base. Okay, and then when we're in lab, you will be shown where it is stored, okay? We're talking about good laboratory, laboratory practices, right? So because Wade, because Wade tests are the least regulated, and because individuals who perform these tests may have very little training, one might ask, are wave tests accurate and reliable? Those performing wave tests should strive to have good laboratory practices so the patient can be assured of the reliability, um, efficiency, and quality of their test results. So when we're talking about good laboratory practice, they include the following things. When you get a new kit in, Okay, first you want to make sure that that kit is clear waved. Okay, you want to keep that package insert and you can have a three ring binder or a filing system of some sort inside your lab so you can take the newest package insert from your kit and make sure that's the one up front that everybody's looking at because you don't want them looking at an old package insert from another kit because these kits can change and vary in the way they're done from kit to kit. So you always want to look at any new kit you or, uh, open up. So you want to perform proper specimen collection. Okay, because the things you need to keep in mind is that's why I say I don't care if you've been using this kit for the past year. Each and every time you open up a new kit, you need to look at it. You need to pull the package insert out. And you need to look over that package insert because from time to time they will change something on you. And you don't want to be running the new kit on the old kit's directions when something's changed. It could affect your results. Okay? So you want to make sure you collect the specimen. And a lot of kits have special tubes or containers that you collect the blood in or special swabs. You want to make sure you use the correct thing. And you want to read that package insert. Is this something that once you've opened it, it now goes in the refrigerator or do you keep it at room temperature or does part of the kit stored in the refrigerator and the other part at room temperature? Read over your package insert each time you open up a new kit and make sure you become familiar with not only how to use it and what collection method needs to be used, but also how it is to be stored. You want to always properly ID your patients. We always ID ourselves to the patient and introduce ourselves to the patient because remember, no matter what, we're in customer service. They could go to any doctor's office. They could go to any hospital. We want them to come to us, right? So you want to properly ID your patient. Make sure that you're sticking the correct patient. You want to in inform your patient of the proper patient prep, okay? Were they supposed to be fasting, okay? Is this a clean catch urine that they need to collect? You need to talk to your patient and inform them of what they need to do either before you collect this specimen or if you're sending them home and they're coming back at a later date and they need to be fasting, you need to make sure they understand that. Once you have collected your specimen and you never label it prior to collection, then you properly label each one of your specimens. Okay, when you're reading that package insert for each one of your kits, you want to make sure you understand the test procedure. Be observant for changes, like I said, because they do make minor changes from kit to kit. Make sure you know your time requirements before you get started, because sometimes if you collect your specimen and then you're not aware 
that the very first thing needs to be done and what needs to be done within a few seconds and you don't have your stuff out, it could cause you to have to go back and swab that patient's throat again or anything. So make sure you read over it. You know all the time requirements. You have all your reagents and equipments ready to go before you test. You also remember you have to perform QC, okay? And also, if you have an internal QC on that test kit, like, like say a pregnancy test, okay? You have, once, once in that kit's open, you may have to run QC on that, quit, on that kit with a known, um, a, re, a known specimen, right? So you open up the kit for the very first time, you read through it, you know what it takes, you know what you're doing, you get your known QC urine, you run that pregnancy test, that's a positive and a negative. So you take two of your kits out, you run a positive on one, a negative on the other, you know which is which. What should happen is on your negative um, control, you should get a negative result, but you should also get a line that shows that that internal QC is working as well. Okay, so you may only have one line on the negative one because that one line is just where your internal QC is. Then on the positive control you ran, it will have a positive mark showing that the test is positive. And also the internal control line will be there. So you may have two things showing up on that. Now, once you've ran it on that kit, a lot of kits, that's all you have to do. Then going forward, when you have a patient come in and the doctor orders a pregnancy test on them, you properly collect, properly ID your patient, properly collect your urine, properly run the test by the directions. You look to make sure that QC's already been ran on that kit. If it has, you just run that patient. As long as that internal control comes out properly, then you can print out your results. You can record your results as positive or negative. You always want to make sure you store your reagents properly. Um, you want to keep a lot of them need to be kept out of light. You always want to make sure that you put the caps back on tightly and that all temperature requirements are met. And you always want to note expiration dates. Never mix components from one kit to the next. If there's some reagent left over in one kit, you never want to just move it to another kit. All of those need to be properly disposed of. And then you open up the new kit and, and, and start over from there. And then you always want to record your patient's test results correctly on the correct patient. So like we were talking about, okay, we have quality control monitoring of qualitative wave tests, right? Qualitative tests. Tests that simply look for the presence or absence of the substance. In other words, we're not giving you a number. We're just saying it's there or it's not there, okay? Then qualitative tests. So you want to add this to your concept folder, definition in own words and example, okay? So your internal control is that built-in positive control used in qualitative tests to prove that the test cassette is working, okay? So for a qualitative test, QC consists of running an internal control with each test and two levels of external control, one normal and one abnormal when the test kit is first open. That's what I talked about earlier. Now this gives you a picture of that. At the very top on number one, you see they opened up this fresh cassette. It's HCG, so this is a pregnancy test. You see the test line and the C line. Test is whether you're gonna get a positive or negative result, whether they are or not pregnant, and the C is their control. So if you see in number two, what, what's that one? Okay, what would you report out on that? First of all, you can report a result out because your control worked, because there's a line right there, that's that internal control, and then you would report this out as positive because there's a line under test. Number three, you can report this one out as well, but this would be a negative, right? So you guys can see the difference and understand that when you open the kit the very first time, you run two controls, a positive and a negative, right? And what you're looking for is, let's just say number two is your positive control, an external control that you used, and it worked. You just opened this kit for the very first time. You ran your negative control in number three, and it works because it says it's negative and your internal control work. So you will document that external controls have been run on this kit and they work. 
Then after that, for that particular kit, all you have to do is run your patient and make sure that your internal control works. So here's your concept, right? Your homework, you can do this um, now or you can wait till later, but you're gonna describe, describe a qualitative test in your own words and give an example of a qualitative test. And you wanna learn to be able to write these self, this stuff out in your own words and really understand it because if you get a question like this on a test and it's an essay question and it's blank and you have to write it up, if you haven't been doing these homeworks, you're not gonna be able to effectively answer those essay questions on a test. So you wanna make sure that in your concept one, that your answer includes that test for the presence or absence of a substance, right? And an example would be something like a pregnancy test, strep test, flu test, that kind of thing. So still on good laboratory practices, and we're talking about quality control monitoring of qualitative wave test. So if the device does not show a positive QC result, the test should be repeated. If the repeated test also fails, then corrective active action should be taken. Okay, what is corrective action? It's action taken when quality control results show a test is not working properly. So in other words, I'm gonna use for example, a glucose. We, a lot of us have seen these little handheld glucose machines. You can buy them at Walgreens. These are a wave test because they're supposed to be simple to do, simple to read, right? So let's just say you have one of those in your physician's office lab. Y'all do a lot of glucoses, okay? So you come in that morning, you run your controls, okay? And they don't work. They don't fall within the range that they're supposed to. The very first thing you always want to do is repeat it because you could have, it's first thing in the morning, maybe you didn't get enough sample into there, maybe anything could be going on. It could have been a user error where you just missed one little step or didn't do something right. And instead of trying to do a whole lot of other stuff, the very first thing is just repeat it. Because a lot of times you do that and you get the right result and you, and you move on from there, okay? Now, if you repeat it a second time and it doesn't work, then you need to take some kind of corrective action and as you'll hear, if it's not documented, it didn't happen and you need to document this stuff. OK, and you should never perform your patient's test on an instrument that the QC failed under until you perform some type of corrective action. And then you can show the steps that you took to fix the problem. And now your controls are coming within range. So let's just say there's only a few strips left in that uh, a uh, vial of strips that you were using for that particular glucose monitor. And you looked at it and they were really close to being um, uh, expired. They weren't expired and there were still a few in there, but you've got to remember moisture from the air each and every time you open those strips gets into that strips and can damage those strips. So as you're opening and closing them and opening them and closing repeatedly over time, then when you get down to the end, very possibly it could get to the point where they're not working properly. So if you've ran it again and they're still not working, you can get rid of those test strips, get a new uh, new vial of test strips, run your controls again. If it comes in range, now you know that was the problem. You can re record what your corrective action was, that you opened up a new uh, vial of strips and now your controls came in. Now you can start running your patient's results. If you can't get that machine to give you proper QC, most physicians office labs, most labs will have a backup monitor. You pull that backup monitor out and you start using it. Okay, so examples of corrective action that we, I just talked to you about some, okay? They can be that. We can also have the, the reagents weren't kept at the correct uh, temperature. You need to change the battery. The instrument needs to be cleaned, okay? And then there is user error. Did you follow the directions? Which usually you can catch that when you repeat it, okay? Were reagents added in the correct order? Did you let it sit the correct time? Did you let it sit too long, not long enough, okay? So when QC results show a test is out of control, it should be recorded on the QC log, okay? When they come in to inspect your lab, if they see that you have never had a QC out of result, a fall out of range, they're gonna dig because they're gonna feel like that you may be falsely putting down QC results because 
There's going to come a time when your QC is just not going to come in, guys. They expect that, okay? And you want to record those times. But what they want to see is that your QC was out of range. This is the create, create, uh, excuse me, corrective action that you took. This is where you got your reagent to come, I mean, your controls to come in range. And then you started testing with your patient. This shows accrediting agents or, or people that come in and look over your um, results that you know what you're doing. You're actually running it. Sometimes it comes out of range. This was a problem and you took care of it. They would rather see that than see somebody that claims they have never, ever had a QC out on any instrument they have. That's going to be a red flag to them that something there may not be right. Okay, so external controls. That's what we talked about, internal and external, right? So external controls, as you would see, would be something that would be outside that testing kit, right? So they can be liquids uh, that are positive, negative, high, low, normal, okay? And they're used the same way you would do a, a patient. So like when we were talking about that glucose or that pregnancy test, you're going to take that control sample and you are going to run it exactly the same way you would a patient, and then you're going to get your results, match it against what they should be, and make sure you're recording it, okay? So here's another one of those homeworks, right? So describe corrective action and how it is used in your own words and give an example of corrective action. Again, guys, if y'all don't take the time to do this, you're going to get an essay question on a test that is going to ask you to describe something in your own words and you're not going to be able to do it. So really make sure you take the time to make sure you know how to describe these things in your own words, because it also makes you fully understand. It's one thing in healthcare, whether you're taking anatomy and physiology or medical terminology, there's a lot of things that you need to memorize. It's just rogue memory, okay? But you also need to take all those things that you memorize and be able to apply them out in the field as a medical assistant, a phlebotomist, a lab assistant, a nurse, a respiratory therapist, okay? So make sure that your answer includes these things, okay? In corrective action, it is the action taken to find out why the QC result did not turn out as expected. And then some examples of corrective action, right? We talked about this, right? Doing it over one time, changing the batteries, all that kind of thing, okay? But you want to make sure it's always recorded because if you do not document what's going on, it did not happen. Here's another one of our clinical thinking and higher learning activities. So you guys can pause this and see if you can answer it. Use this as a tool to help you study. Okay, we're still on uh, good laboratory practices because this is vitally important. We want to make sure that we are following all the rules and regulations. We're doing everything correctly because these results that we're giving to these doctors, these physicians are using these results to diagnose, monitor, and treat our patients. And so just imagine if this was yourself or your child or your niece and nephew or your parents or your grandparents and that medical assistant or lab assistant or phlebotomist just had a very flippant attitude and really was not taking this seriously and was reporting out lab results that were not accurate and your doc that your grandmother's doctor was using them to diagnose her and something got missed or she gave her the wrong medicine or hurt her in some kind of way possibly can even kill people so we want to make sure that we are following all these rules and regulations to a t it's vitally important that you are a professional and you behave as one and always perform your quality monitoring, okay? So when we're talking about earlier, you remember I talked about that you run that test result, whether it's on your QC or your patient, and you're not getting a number. It doesn't tell you 1.77, right? It says positive or negative for pregnancy, positive or negative for the flu, right? Not a specific number, okay? So there's semi-qualitative tests, there's quantitative tests, and there's qualitative tests, okay? So we talked about qualitative, right? Now we're talking about quantitative and you guys need to make sure that you understand the difference between the qualitative test 
where you just get that thing that you see, that positive or negative, and you're not getting a number, and then where you move into these qualitative tests where you're actually either semi or getting a test result. Okay, so let's look at the difference. Semi-qualitative, right? So these give you an approximate quantity of that analyte, and, and, and the picture you see, it's a dipstick urine. So in that dipstick urine, it's kind of like a qualitative because you're looking at a, a color change, right? But you're comparing that color change to a spectrum of color changes that you can have, and, and they fall into a range. So it's kind of semi-qualitative. You can understand that. When we do this in lab, you'll be able to see this better. But if you're holding that strip up, that strip's going to give you on one analyte, let's just say protein, okay? It's going to give you a range of like a really light color to a really dark color. And with each one of those color changes comes a numeric number that it falls within this broad range, right? So you qualitatively look at it, at the color change, match it up to the color it's closest to, and then at the underneath that, it gives you a number, a quantitative number, right? But it's kind of semi-qualitative, so that's an example of that. And then quantitative, that's tests that give a numerical value showing the exact amount, okay? That semi-qualitative is giving you a range. This is giving you an exact amount of an analyte. Like that bottom picture is a um, AccuCheck glucose monitor. And if you'll see on there, they've ran that glucose either on a patient or a control and they've got 104. So that's a numeric value. That person's glucose is 104, okay? So make sure you understand the difference between the qualitative, semi-quantitative, and quantitative testing, okay? So quantitative test. So to add to the concept folder definition in your own words and an example, right? We're going to have that. You're going to need to be able to do that. And again, y'all, I hate to harp on this, but I see it missed in tests all the time. People just want to run through this real quick, answer the review guides, and then you don't study it and you don't start to learn as a healthcare professional to be able to take these words and these things and be able to put them all together and use them in practice when you're out caring for your patient. So make sure you can put this stuff in your own words. So for, for semi-quantitative and quantitative tests, Q, QC consists of running two levels of external controls, one normal and usually one abnormal. You have usually have three levels of control. You have a normal, abnormal, abnormally high and abnormally low. But CLIA, as we'll get more into this, you'll understand CLIA only makes us run two uh, levels of controls um, each day that you've done the test in your lab or each eight hour shift because like with a physician's lab, you know, you're, some of them are only open eight hours of the day. So if you run your QC in the morning, two levels of control and glucose, then you don't have to run it again during your shift and then the, the clinic closes and you go home and you come back the next day and start it over. But as a lot of you may know, if you're working in a lab in a hospital, it's open 24 hours a day. So they may have to run controls uh, two levels of controls more than one time a day, okay? So here's one of those concepts, right, that's in your uh, one-inch black lab binder that was handed out to you, and you need to get good at being able to put these things into your own words. So describe a quantitative test in your own words and give an example. So your answer needs to say something like this, that a test that gives you a numerical value and tests like a glucose test that we talked about, a CBC, a H and H, which is a hemoglobin hematocrine. These are examples of quantitative tests because like I told you in the glucose, it gave you the exact number, 104 or whatever it may be. Here's one of our critical thinking activities. And these are really, really good, guys, because these are not only you seeing if you understand these concepts and you can answer these questions, it really will help you on a test. They will be on a test. But these get you comfortable with knowing that when you're out there in that physician's office, you're able to take what you're learning and apply it. So let's go over this one together. So the physician you work for wants you to start running flu tests. So you go and you look and you order uh, the test kit, right? When it comes in, the package insert says it is a wave test and that the test results will be reported as either negative or positive for the flu. 
What type of test is it? Is it a, a qualitative or a quantitative test? It's qualitative, right? Because it didn't give you a numeric value. It gave you just a positive or negative. You look down at it, you look for a plus or a minus, or you look for a line or no line, right? So that's a qualitative test. Did it have an internal control? Yes, every one of these kits like this, whether it's for mono or the flu or for a, a pregnancy test, is going to have a built-in internal control that if that built-in internal control does not work, you cannot accept those results and you have to take corrective action. Yes, remember we talked about this. Whenever you open a brand new kit, you have to run external controls. You would probably, for this, this particular test, you would have two controls. One that was a known value of being positive for the flu and one that was a known value for being negative for the flu. You would run at the, when you opened up that control, you would run both. And if the one that was supposed to be positive was and the internal control worked and the one that was negative showed as negative and its internal control worked, then you can start using that kit on your patients as long as you make sure you record all results. So we're still talking about good laboratory practices, right? And we're talking about quality control monitoring of quantitative tests. Okay, so besides running your QC, okay, most instruments require some type of optic check and or coding of the instrument, okay? And if you look over here to your left in these little pictures, that is an optic control right there that is used to put into your instrument and do optic checks. So what are optic checks, okay? That's the process of confirming that the light source and the light sensor in that particular instrument are working properly. And you need to record that the optic check was done and you need to do that per your manufacturer's guidelines. If they tell you that you need to check the optics on your instrument once a month, then you need to do it once a month and record that it was done. And of course, if it's not working, you're going to have to do corrective action and troubleshoot that issue until you can get the optic check to work. There's also calibration, right? Lots of machines have to be calibrated. That's the standardization or adjusting an instrument so that it is accurate. Just like a scale, and if a lot of you have seen those older scales where you, you could, um, when no one's on the scale, you could take the little dial on the back of the scale and dial it and make sure that dial is set to zero before you get on it and weigh yourself. Okay, because ever so often people getting on and getting off and getting on of these scales, they can they can get off. And so every once in a while you want to look down at your scale if you had that particular type of scale and make sure that you put it back to zero. That's sort of like calibrating that in a very um, easy way. Uh, a lot of our instruments have a little more um, process for calibration. That gives you an idea of what I'm talking about. So in an optic check, it's sometimes referred to as calibration, okay? Because of most chemistry in instruments, it's the optics that are adjusted to work with the reagent used in the test. So you can hear that um, overused just because uh, light source beaming through a specimen is what's used a lot in um, chemistry analyzers. So coding, and you'll see this a lot when you're using uh, glucose monitors. So coding is setting the instrument so it works properly when a new set of test supplies, which would be the strips or reagents are necessary. So if you see this over here, the little uh, to your right, the little test strip uh, container that I talked about earlier, it says 50 blood glucose test strips. If you see that little, um, it looks like a little, um, you see the test strips or the long narrow strips. I'm sure a lot of you've seen those before. And then this is the little coding piece that's right over here to the left. Okay, and what you would do is when you open up these new test strips, you would take your instrument, you would take out the old coding um, device piece that was in there, take it out, and then you would put the new one in and follow the directions to code that instrument before you started using those new test strips. If not, it will most likely make it can make your controls not work and then your patients aren't turning out right. So you always want to make sure your instruments are coded. 
So according to CLIA, like I said earlier, two levels of QC must be run every eight hours each day of patient testing. Now, what that means is, like I said, if you worked at a place that did glucose almost every single day, day in and day out, a lot of times you would come in and go ahead and run those glucose control, external controls just to get it out of the way because you know you're going to have one done that day. But say that there's a test for mono and you almost never get mono test ordered. They're ordered maybe once a week. Then you would not normally just come in and run those controls because really that's not cost effective, okay? You wanna wait and see if you get an order for that mono. Then if you do, you're going to open up your QC book in the computer or if it's a manual book you have in your lab, you're going to run those external controls, checking to make sure the internal controls work, record those results, then you can run your patient, okay? So the QC results, like I said, must be entered into a log and then grafted daily. So still on good laboratory practices, and we're still talking about QC, the QC results must be evaluated statistically and monitored over time. Okay, so the mean of a group of QT, QC test results is determined, then the standard deviation is calculated. So the mean is the average, and the standard deviation is the amount of variation from that mean, right? And if you'll see this on this example, there's that big black line running in the middle. That's your mean, right? So your mean is 120. And so plus one standard deviation above that is 140, minus one standard de deviation is 99, okay? And then you'll see, here's your results grafted from 50 to 200 on the on your far uh, left-hand side. And then your standard deviation and your mean is listed on your right-hand side. And then across the bottom is the dates that you ran your quality control, okay? And you wanna graph this so you can start seeing if a problem is starting to develop before it becomes a problem. That's what we want to do. We can also pinpoint if we have a person working in the lab that maybe they're, they're always the one that seems to get the really high, the really low results. These can be very valuable in you spotting issues that are going on in your lab and get a hold of them early because we always want to give out the most accurate and reliable result as possible. So the goal is for QC results to fall within that plus or minus two standard deviations. And you'll see that. You see your white area right there in the mean, right? Then you see that plus two standard deviations, that 160 and that minus two standard deviations at 78. You see how that's a pale color there. That's where we want to stay. Of course, the great thing is you really want most of that right there in that white area, right? And then if you get that one, and I'm sure y'all can spot that one that's outside the plus two standard deviation, that's what you wanna avoid. Okay, so the Levi Jennings chart, okay? We need to know what this is. The Levi Jennings chart is a graph showing QC results over time. And that Levi Jennings chart is what we can use to catch issues before they're actually issues so that we can make sure we're getting the best results humanly possible. So out of control, like I talked about that earlier, right? Outside that two standard deviation, we see that one pinpointed up there, right? That's when a QC test results falls outside that plus or minus two standard deviations. So by plotting QC results daily on a Levi Jennings chart, they can be observed over time to identify our problems, right? That's what you need to know about that Levi Jennings chart. So what are three types of problems that can occur on a Levi Jennings chart? You can have excessive scatter, and y'all can see that in that top um, example there, okay? That's just all over the place, okay? That's results varying widely above and below the mean, okay? Then you have a trend. We have downward trend or an upward trend where values move gradually upwards or downwards over time. You can see a sample of that in the center there. And then you can have shift. That's where values jump from one constant set of results to another constant set of results. In our, in our, we can use these in multiple ways to catch issues that are going on before they happen. And we can catch, like in this shift, that may be one uh, medical assistant that's doing results on these set days and another one that's on 
these set days. And we don't need that. We need everybody to be doing it exactly the same. Okay. And we don't want to see any of these things. We don't want to see excessive scatter or any downward or upward trends. And we want to catch those early. And we certainly don't want to see a bunch of shifts. Okay. And this is one of the critical slides where as a medical assistant, you're taking the knowledge that you need and you're putting it to play so that when you're out there working, you know what you're doing and you're able to really take care of this stuff. Okay, now, we've been talking about accuracy, precision, and reliability, but what are they? Okay, so we want to make sure you're accurate, right? So the correctness, the ability to produce test results close to the mean, okay? But you also want to have precision, reproducibility, right? The ability to produce the same test result each time but you also need to be reliable. That is the ability to produce both accurate and precise results. You can be producing accurate results, but they're not precise. And if they're not both accurate and precise, they're not reliable, okay? So we'll go over more of this actually when we're in lab too, but these are things that you just need to understand, okay? So. You need to be accurate, you need to be precise, and you need both of these things to be considered reliable. Okay, so moving on to HIPAA privacy rules. HIPAA is very important, and a lot of people don't really understand what HIPAA really is all about. They have the basis, but they don't put it all together. So, so what happens is we have the government intervene because we want to make sure that we have patient confidentiality because issues have arisen in the past that have caused the government to have to step in, and so now they have, and this is where we are. So HIPAA, okay, and make sure you're following along with your view guides and filling them out, okay? So federal law consisting of several components, one of which contains provisions to protect a patient's privacy. So during lab testing, many individuals handle protected health information to financial information, to test results, to diagnosis, right? So PHI, right, protected health information, any health information that contains patient identifiable information that must be kept confident. Because of HIPAA, never give a patient or family member any test results without the physician's permission. You might say to that patient, I'm sorry, I'm not authorized to disclose that test information, right, whatever it is. The doctor will interpret and explain the results to you. Risk management, okay? So the awareness and management of the physical and procedural risks that are being uh, bring about any injury or legal action against a practice, right? So the first part of that is awareness. So we need to be aware of anything out there that could open anybody up to injury and, or, and, and things that could, people could take legal action against us for. Because if you're not aware of them, then you can't manage them. So you need to know what they are. Then you need to have policies and procedures in place to manage them, okay? 
So what is the best defense against legal action in the laboratory? First and foremost, it's like I've said multiple times during this presentation, good documentation. If it's the good documentation of written office procedures first, okay? You need to have policies and procedures in your office for how to do everything in there. You need to have accurate charting and accurate logging of tests and control results and the use of appropriate abbreviations. That's why we will study these abbreviations and have them on test because you need to use the appropriate uh, abbreviations. Legible writing, okay? If when you write in cursive, no one can read it or, you know, it's hard to read, then you need to take your time to print out so that people can understand and it's very legible what you're writing. Proper corrections, we're gonna go over that in just a second in the patient's chart. So proper corrections, right? Remember, these documents could become legal documents in a court of law, right? So we don't want to give anybody any um, reason to not understand or believe what is being documented, right? So good doc documentation is your best risk management. So as you'll see an example, if you write something down wrong, it was supposed to be 120 and you wrote 12, got in a hurry, which you should not do. But what you want to make sure you do is stuff is in ink, right? And you do not use white out and you do not scratch it all out so you cannot tell what's underneath there. What you want to do is take, put one line through it, put your initials, and then out beside it, you write the correct answer. All must be legible and we need to properly see what you put that one line through. That's why you don't scratch it out. Timely communication and processing of the patient's test results is also good risk management because you want to make sure that as quickly as you can you communicate those test results and document those test results correctly so electronic medical records they have the capability to take the test results directly from the laboratory instrument to a patient's medical record and immediately alert the physician about the results so when using electronic medical records, it is the healthcare worker's responsibility to enter information for laboratory orders, requisitions, test results, and reports electronically. Barcoding, okay? That's, that's the standard these days for most of our, especially our bigger hospitals, okay? These are ways to cut errors. Okay, so a series of narrow and wide bands, as y'all know, you see that example, is used as a barcode, okay? All the information is housed inside that barcode. So how do we use those in the lab? They're used for, to, used for positive patient identification, right? I mean, we're getting to the point now, like at Willis Knight, and they have what they call Moby up on the floor, and they have a handheld unit, and then when they go into their patient's room, they can take that handheld unit, they can scan a barcode on the back of their ID. So now that, that handheld computer knows it's them and it will record their information as the person collecting this blood or doing whatever they're doing. Then they can use that barcode to, bar to scan the barcode on the patient's ID bracelet. That way they know it's that patient, okay? So they have requisitions with barcodes on it. And it cuts down errors because now you're not having to rely on you writing down the right thing, people being able to read each other's uh, handwriting and all that kind of stuff, okay? It really can prevent errors. So statistics show that the error rate for manual data entry is one in 300 compared to one in 3 million when using barcodes. So what is a proper way to identify a patient prior to applying a barcode to a requisition slip and specimen? So you ask the patient to state their name, okay? So if I were to, if I was going in to, to draw some blood on a patient, I might walk in there and I would say, hi, my name is Ms. Shepard. I'm here to draw your blood, I'm from the lab. Will you please tell me your full name and date of birth, okay? I don't want to tell them the name and then have them answer me because a lot of people don't hear real well and they may think they heard the correct thing, but they didn't. So you get them to state their full name. 
Okay, then you ask them for another identifier, whether it's their social security number, date of birth, or telephone number. And make sure you're not asking them this information in front of lots of other people because we don't want them to state their private information out loud around a lot of other people. You might wanna wait until you're in the room with them or if you've got them in the lab and it's just you in the lab with them, right? You check to make sure that the stated information agrees with the requisition slip that you should have in your hand. And as they are stating their name and they're stating their date of birth, you're looking at that requisition slip to make sure those two things are the same. Then you have the patient sign the barcode labels that will be affixed through the requisition slip and the specimen so that that patient looks at it too. And also that's another set of eyes on it to make sure it's correct. So here's some key terms and abbreviations that we need to know. So you can use these slides as a way to test yourself and a way to learn because these key terms and abbreviations will be on this test. And they're some of the most missed stuff along with being able to write out in your own words what things mean. So make sure y'all take this stuff seriously and go over it. So, in summary, in this chapter we talked about, okay, I'm not going to read all these off to you, but this is a summary of what we talked about. This is what you should know, okay? This covers everything that we've learned in Chapter 1 and in Chapter 2. So here's some more reviews. We're gonna go through them quickly, but you can really, really use these to, to put everything together. Remember, read chapter one and chapter two in your textbook. Remember, watch the PowerPoint presentation for chapter one and chapter two and fill out the accompany guides for each chapter and then study those. And then you can use these PowerPoint presentations as a way to study with yourself with these types of review questions and our critical thinking slides. So when I ask you in class, what focus knob do you use when you're, on, when you're using your oral immersion lens, you are not gonna know what to say, right? And when I talk about CLIA, you're gonna understand. So make sure that you look at your syllabus, okay? Make sure you're looking over that tentative course calendar, okay? And we will go over a lot of this stuff in our lab, face-to-face -face lab class, but that tentative course calendar can be a big help to you. And it is tentative, so things could change, but if they do, you will know way ahead of time. And while we're in class, you will be able to change those dates and you know exactly what you're doing. So we know homework assignments, right? There's homework assignments that are in your um, black binder for chapters one and two, and you have to fill those out. When is your first test, guys? Look at your tentative course calendar. We're looking for that first test. Test one on chapters one and two or is Wednesday, September the 9th. It will be online. It will be a time test, okay? And I've done these tests online before, and I've timed them before, and it works good. Each, you will only be able to take it once. Those questions will lock. You will not be able to go back. So once you answer it, you can't go back. So that's why I'm saying you need to study this stuff because that time's going to go by fast and you have to answer that question 
then. So if you spend a lot of time trying to unfortunately cheat and look questions up, you are going to run out of time and you will not pass that test. I've seen it happen, okay? So if you read chapters one and two, fill out your review guides, um, watch these PowerPoint presentations, actually study this material, know your key terms and your abbreviations, you will make an A. If you don't, you're gonna get caught, okay? What should you study for the test? We went over that, right? What goes in the black binder? You're gonna be given that, right? Your first day of lab, it's gonna have holes punched in it, you're gonna put it in the black binder that you buy. What are you turning for a grade? We will arrange for you to turn in your black binder to me in lab and I will grade it. And I went over what I based that grade on, right? What goes in the white uh, workbook uh, binder? Okay, I'm gonna hand the white lab binder out to you in lab, right? What do you turn in for a grade? Again, you're gonna turn in your workbook package. They're gonna be stapled together. And when we finish them all up at the end of those labs, you turn those labs in for a grade. Also remember to look at your blood exposure, okay? So if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, please reach out to me. All my contact information is on Canvas and on your syllabus. You guys have a great day. See you soon.